the, the, the real samples that we can get from industrial processes uh, differs quite a lot from, uh, let, let's say, model substances. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we use this naming. So the, the outline of the uh, presentation is a very, very short background. And then I will talk uh, a little bit about technical lignans and biomass fractionation. And then I'll leave the uh, word to Omar, uh, who knows much, much, much uh, more about lignin oxidation and modification than I do. And uh, then we'll see if we can make some general conclusions towards the end. And so, as a background, uh, lignin, as we will see a little bit later on, can come in very many different uh, shapes and forms. And uh, from very, very low purity, uh, that is basically only suitable for combustion, uh, up to very, very um, specialized lignin samples uh, that, uh, that can be uh, extracted from uh, different kinds of biomasses uh, with very specialized techniques. And uh, of course, the low purity lignin is available at, uh, at much larger volumes than uh, uh, the others. Uh, but uh, the, the important thing here is that uh, there is a gap between the, uh, the, the price that you need to pay for the lignin and the uh, price that you will uh, be able to get from products that are made from these different lignins. Uh, so, uh, there, there, there is, of course, uh, a need uh, not only to find uh, the, the right uh, raw material, uh, but also to, to find a, the appropriate uh, application for that lignin. So very highly specialized modified lignins uh, for and use them for combustion would not really be a good idea. Uh, if you were to ab able to use very, uh, let's say, mm, uh, low quality lignin and turn them into phenol de derivatives, it would of course be good, but the market wouldn't be really, really great. So that's how you should read this graph. Now you can move on. Thank you. Uh, depending on the, the, I mean, what, what our research, uh, the stuff Josephine said, biomass fractionation, and what, what we come from is basically the ethanol program, uh, where a lot of uh, characterization of different biomasses has been done. So, so this is actually a, a table from, from the ethanol research, but it has bearing on, on the lignin part as well. But because different biomasses have different uh, composition. Uh, in terms of amount of lignin. Then, of course, also there are uh, very different characteristics of the lignin that is present in different biomasses. And I think Omar has something to say about this a little bit later on. But depending on the biomass that we start from, uh, we will get different amounts of lignin. And these are just a couple of examples. There are uh, there are biomasses with even less lignin uh, than what we have in the uh, the agricultural uh, crops that we usually uh, work with. And we can move on. Yeah. So when when we talk about lignin fractionation, uh, it's uh, uh, how, how shall I put it? Uh, the, 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 the most common methods are uh, methods that are based on 
uh, acidity or alkalinity that we work on a pH scale. And this is all uh, also has its origin, this graph uh, from, from, let's say, a biorefinery ethanol uh, perspective. But uh, what it basically tells us is that if we work at uh, low pHs, uh, we, then we typically dissolve the hemicelluloses. And if we work at high pHs, uh, we typically dissolve the lignin. And uh, cellulose has a tendency, tendency to go unaltered through these processes. Uh, and uh, and then if, if we then uh, you can move ahead one slide. Uh, and the last uh, couple of years, uh, the the lignin first uh, approach has been uh, a buzzword. Uh, so meaning that if we want to uh, have a lignin to work with, we should get that out from the biomass first. Uh, but if you do have a separation process uh, or a fractionation process, you always get two materials out from it. So in, in my world, as someone working with separation and fractionation, uh, you can go back uh, a little bit, uh, Omar. Uh, yeah, stay there for a while. In my world, uh, uh, going, uh, talking about um, uh, fractionation, you, from a fractionation process, you always get two streams out. Uh, so, so if you fractionate biomass, lignin will be in one of the fraction even after the first... Um, uh, after, after the first process. So I don't think that uh, lignin first is a the, the, the way we should look at this. Uh, in, in any way we do it, uh, and, and the, the idea behind lignin first is that we should have a lignin that has been uh, tampered with as uh, little as possible and still get it out of the biomass. But that doesn't mean that we need to take out the lignin first, uh, so to speak. Yes. So I have a couple of examples on what we have been doing for the last, let's say, uh, 20 years. And this first example is actually uh, my own uh, PhD work, basically. So it's far back in time. Uh, in the Swedish pulp and paper industry, we have tons and tons and tons of lignin uh, being pumped around uh, and eventually used as a fuel in the recovery boilers. And in uh, the EcoCyclic pulp mill research program uh, 20 years ago, uh, lignin extraction was, uh, we, we actually worked on two different processes. Uh, one that ended up as the Lignoboost uh, process, and one that eventually uh, ended up uh, a little bit later on as the sun carbon process, uh, actually. Uh, but the, the, the issue with uh, the lignin in the craft black liquor is that it is mixed up uh, with uh, quite a lot of cooking chemicals, of course, and also other uh, components, non-cellulosic uh, wood components from the um, from the raw material. Uh, and if we look at a, a a pulp mill with a a continuous uh, digestion process. Uh, there are actually uh, many different uh, plausible uh, points in the mill where we could extract lignin. Uh, 
uh, initially we uh, started looking at the craft black liquor that uh, was on its way to the uh, evaporation plant. And uh, we started working with ultrafiltration at high temperatures uh, to, uh, to concentrate the lignin. Uh, and uh, that worked kind of. Uh, it didn't work perfect. Uh, we later moved into the actual digester uh, and, and took side streams from the digester uh, and uh, uh, took out lignin uh, with the intention of uh, recirculating the uh, lignin lean uh, permeate uh, back to the digester. Uh, instead of uh, black liquor impregnation, it would be black liquor permeate impregnation, uh, which was then an intention that th this would uh, uh, speed up the, li the lignification during the uh, actual digestion. Uh, so to get an added benefit of lignin removal, uh, we also went into the uh, uh, evaporation plant and took uh, pre-concentrated um, um, uh, black liquor and, uh, uh, and did a membrane separation on, on that as well. And all these positions, we, we did the, this in a little bit different ways in all, all of them. Uh, uh, the intention was always to get a, a, a purer craft black liquor lignin. Uh, but you also have to remember that with, with membrane filtration, you will never get a completely pure, uh, uh, pure lignin. Uh, you will need a process afterwards to uh, get rid of the rest of the water and possibly some cooking chemicals. Uh, so what, what we showed together with Chalmers uh, and the development they did on the Ligna Boost was that uh, we, and, and this has also be, been one of the things that uh, Sun Carbon has uh, looked further at, is to reduce the amount of acid needed uh, by and uh, being able to uh, recycle the alkali uh, to the digestion process um, uh, without disturbing the uh, sodium sulfur balance too much at the bulk mill. So, so in these cases, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the membrane process acts more or less as a kidney, but it will need a a finishing um, process uh, to uh, get something that those that want to work with lignin would like to work with, so to speak. Yes, now we can move ahead. We can skip that. Uh, another thing that we recently have worked with is something called hydrotropic extraction. Uh, and uh, you have a link or at the bottom there to Johanna's dissertation uh, a month back, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, hydrotropic extraction um, is a way of extracting uh, lignin. Uh, and it has been presented as a lignin first uh, alternative. Uh, by using these uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, compounds uh, that basically creates a network uh, that solubilizes lignin preferentially. And we used uh, sodium silene sulfonate, but what we did was not to work with it as a lignin first uh, uh, case because what we did was to actually remove uh, the, the most easily removed substance first, uh, which is the hemicellulose. Uh, I, and th this 
basically go back to uh, normal process design principles that you should uh, take the, the most easy substance out of a solution first. <clears throat> so we uh, used uh, uh, a steam explosion uh, process to hydrolyze the hemicellulose, get it out from the raw material, and then use this uh, sodium silene sulfonate uh, to extract uh, uh, to extract the lignin, which then supposedly we have a, didn't have time to analyze it uh, all the way because we worked a lot of the on the process, but supposedly it has not reacted as much as lignin would normally do in a pulping operation. Uh, and this uh hydrotropic ex extraction can basically be done all the way down uh to 25 degrees with, with good yields uh so so it is a true extraction process in, in some sense but uh that is provided that we have removed the hemicelluloses and opened up the uh, biomass structure first uh, if we use it straight away as a lignin first, you will not extract anything. Uh, but if you're interested in that process, uh, go and listen to the uh, dissertation. It's uh, on YouTube uh, and it's actually a really, really good uh, dissertation and discussion. Um, yes. And then, uh, of course, need to mention the, uh, the lignin that we get from the second generation ethanol process, which is definitely a lignin last uh, uh, process. So uh, in, in the bioethanol process, we have shipping, steam pretreatment, ki kind of severe uh, pretreatment. We subject uh, the material to enzymatic hydrolysis and fermentation, and then send it through a distillation train where the temperature is again uh, high. Uh, the material, we have a mixed material with some kind of lignin, melted lignin droplets together with yeast and enzymes and things. And if you move ahead there, Omar, uh, uh, we get a lignin out of the uh, from the distillation, uh, uh, and typically we have uh, in the ethanol process um, uh, looked at this as something only suitable for combustion. But uh, I think that I don't can't remember if Omar will talk anything about it uh, later on. But uh, there might be possibilities to use this lignin for something good as well. But you need will need to be a little bit more severe towards it because uh, quite a lot of stuff has happened with that lignin uh, before uh, you will get it. And I mean, this, the saying in industry is basically that, I mean, you've heard this before, uh, you can make anything with lignin uh, except money. Uh, but in addition to that, you can get uh, basically any kind of lignin that you want, uh, but uh, it depends on how much you wanna pay for it. Uh, and then the question is still, can you make anything out of lignin except money? And we'll, with that, I'm handing over to Omar to see if we can actually make something with the lignins. So thank you, Ola. Uh, sorry, I have nothing this time about hydrolysis lignin, maybe next uh, seminar. <laughs> uh, but thank you for setting the scene for the upcoming slides, which uh, I will be talking uh, about lignin modifications and degradation. Uh, but before doing that, it feels like uh, classical to start with those uh, Hydroxycinamyl alcohols like the cinepyl alcohol, coniferyl alcohol, and paracomaryl alcohol, or the termed monolignols, who form the primary structure and through oxidative radical polymerization, they form this nice and complex 3D uh, polymer, which we all uh, yeah, like to work with. Um, it happens like random 
And uh, it's not only this is random, it's also connected in a random way. So it can be connected by different linkages. They are termed mostly the RI ether bond linkages and also carbon-carbon uh, bridges, where the highlighted one in the middle is the beta 4 is the most dominant. Uh, they are normally quoted values between 50 to 60%, depending on the botanical origin, if it is hardwood, softwood, or even grasses. So this is just a, a brief background of like, before starting to work with this uh, challenging uh, macromolecule. Uh, speaking like thermochemical wise or thermochemical conversion, there are different ways to uh, transform this lignin uh, or depolymerize it into valuable products. Uh, if we wanna do that, we can classify it uh, broadly into different uh, processes, uh, depending on the temperature range. Uh, but also the initial reaction environment. Uh, it could be done with a chemical oxidation or also termed like oxidative depolymerization, uh, where you use oxidants. Uh, it could be also done with hydroprocessing, uh, could be acid catalyzed, base catalyzed, or hydrothermal treatment, liquid phase reforming, pyrolysis, gasification. They are all different possibilities which you can uh, use in order to uh, thermochemically convert this uh, substance. Uh, the initial reaction environment could be oxidizing atmosphere. We can use hydrogen peroxides, uh, molecular oxygen. Those are the most common uh, oxidants, also air. Uh, it could be neutral. Uh, and the reduction atmosphere, it could be an external hydrogen we can use, uh, or even a hydrogen donating solvent uh, as a reductant. So there are various possibilities. And here I will be just focusing on the chemical oxidation. And that's because basically it's very energy efficient means and it doesn't require so much higher temperature, but also you can get various uh, and multiple functionalities out of this uh, nice uh, aromatic structure. Uh, I mean, it, it involves like a mechanism of radical, uh, radical mechanism, and it, we can degrade this uh, using the oxidants. Uh, if we focus on the phenolic hydroxyl group, we can get uh, compounds like benzokinones. If we focus on the side chain oxidation, we can get different uh, valuable uh, aromatic compounds like phenolic aldehydes, vanillin, seringaldehyde, for example. Phenolic ketones could be also obtained like acetovanillone, acetoseringone, uh, but also phenolic acids, vanillic acid, seringic acid, uh, for instance. Uh, we can also go all the way uh, and uh, use very high temperatures and sometimes high oxygen pressures or air pressure. And then you can actually uh, cleave these aromatic structures in the lignin. And then you can obtain uh, other compounds, which are basically organic acids, uh, formic acid, acetic acid, but sometimes also you get uh, dicarboxylic acids. Succinic acid uh, has been also uh, reported. Um, so it depends on your application and depends on your uh, conditions, you can get those uh, valuable platform molecules, which are really can go all the way through to specialty chemicals and targeted uh, compounds, which we need in various applications. I will uh, be uh, discussing now like the study, which we uh, have reported on using uh, lignosulfonates or sodium lignosulfonates. And this work has been done with, in collaboration with the Center of Catalysis and Sustainable Chemistry at the Technical University in, in Denmark. And uh, in this, we actually screened different uh, heterogeneous catalysis. So delta alumina uh, was the support, copper manganese and nickel molybdenum, and the sulfided form of nickel molybdenum. And uh, in this, uh, it was done in batch uh, under elevated temperature and oxygen, uh, molecular oxygen as the oxidant. Uh, and we have seen uh, uh, transformations related to uh, in the first screening, we have selected the copper manganese, or in this uh, graph, it is a catalyst A. So this graph basically shows the size exclusion chromatograms, where the you can see in the dotted line, uh, the sodium lignosulfonates, which rather exhibit a very uh, broad molecular weight distribution, which shows how impure and how challenging this substrate is. It's, it's also about, yeah, the sulfur. I will go to this later. Um, and uh, using the catalysis and the oxidation, we have managed to reduce significantly the uh, molecular weight. So we can see uh, that we can obtain those low molecular weight compounds using the Cat A or the copper manganese in this sense. 
and uh, you can also get a, even a better homogeneous mixture. So increasing the homogeneity is something we all strive for, and uh, this is something which is, uh, yeah, it can find its way in different variable applications. So increasing homogeneity, reducing the dispersity is something which is, uh, uh, we based our decision that we will continue with this catalyst. So we have done some uh, also uh, high resolution mass spec uh, in order to identify the compounds available in this uh, product uh, mixture. And you can see in here in this base peak uh, ion chromatograms that the different compounds which we identified, basically vanillin, vanillic acid, acetovanillone, uh, hydroxybenzoic acid and hydroxybenzaldehyde. Acetovanillone was not uh, identified in this uh, uh, chromatogram, I, I recall. And, and, uh, and you can see the product mixture in the, in the black line, and you can see the starting material or the sodium lignosulfonates in the blue line. So more monomers we can get, which are basically at least 15, 20 fold times in, in, in price compared to the starting uh, raw material. However, when we work with heterogeneous catalysis, it's indispensable to do characterization. So um, catalyst characterization is very important in this sense. And we use, looking into these uh, same images, uh, on the left side, you can see the fresh catalyst or the copper manganese. And on the right side, you can see the spent catalyst or the catalyst after, uh, uh, after the reaction. Uh, and you can see these dark gray areas, which were attributed later to uh, um, heavy organic uh, deposits and also carbon deposits uh, using different other characterization techniques like nitrogen versus option and also thermogravimetry. So that was actually a major challenge in this sense, so utilizing this uh, heterogeneous system. It's not only about carbon deposits, but also we have uh, 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 elucidated that this, we got also sulfur deposits on the catalyst. So you can see in this uh, elemental mapping uh, images, uh, the sulfur, how it uh, looks in the yellow color on the right hand side. Uh, but also we have seen some leaching in terms of the metals. So we concluded this study that the stability should be further improved uh, to enable uh, a real uh, industrial uh, operation of this catalytic system. Uh, oxidative treatment is also valuable uh, in other uh, like context. And, uh, and in this study, we have actually screened different operating conditions of temperature and oxygen pressure and investigated the oxidation as a form of pretreatment before feeding it into different bugs. And those, uh, those microbial strains, uh, if they can kind of survive and convert it into other uh, speciality chemicals, that, that was the major objectives of this uh, study. So finding a biocompatible uh, mixture uh, out of this oxidation experiments was the major goal. I will not go through the details of all the results of this study, but I just want to highlight uh, in here, we used actually Lignoboost craft lignine. And on the left side, you can see how smooth and uh, is this uh, material, which shows how recalcitrant is this uh, feedstock. And after the treatment, uh, oxidative treatment, we get this nice uh, uh, reduction in the structure integrity where you can see the increase in the specific surface areas, but also those uh, multi-eroded layers where uh, which, could, which could enable actually or ease the later bioconversion step by different uh, providing accessibility to those uh, enzyme secretions. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I really encourage you to go and on the TreeSource platform and register in the workshop, uh, which will be actually in on June 16. Uh, you are welcome to see the program. Uh, there will be really nice talks on the whole value chain for the biological lignin upgrading from the beginning, like overview, depolymerization, analysis, but also real uh, insights on the genetic engineering uh, and the real uh, case studies and applications. So please visit this and register. I will conclude with this study, which we recently reported in the beginning of this year, uh, where we have used also the Lignoboost craft lignin. We have used uh, a bimetallic catalyst in this sense 
uh, it's a vanadium copper system, homogeneous system. And under oxygen pressure and the uh, reasonable uh, reaction temperature, we have obtained uh, the aromatic monomers in good yields, uh, vanadium, vanillic acid, uh, but also high quality uh, by oil uh, fractions up to 50%. So that was the overview about it. And in this study, we have used the dedicated workup procedure uh, for the lignin after uh, treatment, where we started uh, with the reaction uh, mixture acidified in order to precipitate the heavy lignin fractions. And uh, via centrifugation, we get the solid residue separated. And then uh, via liquid-liquid uh, extraction using ethyl acetate, we get the aqueous phase, which is basically uh, the carboxylic acids, uh, but also the uh, spent catalyst. And then we get the organic phase and via drying step, just to ensure that uh, like we have no water in the end prior to the evaporation, we get this high quality bio oil, which can find its way in many forms of uh, potential high value applications. Uh, these are the major monomers, which we ha have identified and quantified. Vanillin was the main, uh, vanillic acid, acetovanillin, but also para substituted aromatics. And we have seen at least 27% improvement compared to the control or the no added uh, catalyst. Using also 2D HSQC NMR, we have seen um, different structural motifs, uh, especially in the aliphatic oxygenated regions. So in the blue, you can see the uh, product mixtures from the copper uh, derived sample. Uh, the red shows only vanadium and the green is the bimetallic vanadium copper system. Uh, Ligno boost uh, was uh, one in the uh, gray areas and the control or the no added catalyst were with the dark blue. And interestingly, you can see that the, those cross patterns or the uh, structure motives for the copper and vanadium were also found in the bimetallic catalyst, which might tell about uh, synergistic effect or combined effect, which shows the potential of this uh, catalytic system. However, uh, in order to elucidate this, we need really a dedicated mechanistic studies where we use reference compounds uh, uh, to, to really elucidate those uh, structures. The full change was also investigated uh, through these volcano plots by a high resolution mass spec. And you can see the vanillin vanillic acid in the uh, blue dots. Uh, and the significantly upper regulated species were basically from the uh, uh, the product sample from the vanadium copper compared to the control one or the reference uh, experiment. Uh, we have managed to identify three uh, tentatively those uh, three molecules, oxalic acid, but also two aromatic uh, compounds possessing an uh, oxoacetic uh, functionalities, which may open new routes even for this kind of uh, platform uh, chemicals. And finally, we did a parametric optimization where we have screened different uh, oxygen pressures, uh, reaction temperatures, different uh, vanadium to copper molar ratios, and also the catalyst to lignin ratios uh, in order to get, get the, a meaningful uh, way of uh, concluding the study. And actually the catalyst recycling was remaining also a subject for future research. So always advisable to have it like in the heterogeneous form. And this is actually research is ongoing to develop uh, a heterogeneous uh, catalyst based on this uh, vanadium copper uh, formulation. And here I will leave the floor back to you, Ula, to conclude the talk. Uh, to put to put this uh, this way, uh, you you can uh, push everything forward there. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll put that away. Uh, the, the, to put it this way, uh, there are many different lignans uh, available uh, in industry and in other processes. Uh, regardless how we uh, have extracted it, it will probably need some modifications before uh, being a good raw material for the kind of processing that Omar is working with. And then uh, this is the, the question here, uh, lignin first or not? Uh, 
Uh, I don't think I have a conclusion on it, uh, but um, uh, I, I don't like the terminology uh, because we, 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 it should r rather be, we should uh, modify the lignin as little as possible in the extraction process so that those that want to uh, do real chemistry on it uh, have functionalities uh, open for to them to work with. Uh, uh, Omar, uh, the last two uh, points, I think they are more related to you. Yes, that's fine. I mean, just to conclude, like the uh, there is a, a great potential for this uh, lignin oxidation uh, uh, and transformation. Uh, it 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 opened new ways to get these uh, various or multiple uh, functionalities and retaining the aromatic structure in lignin uh, to get the uh, value added the different value added products. But we have always to think about the catalyst recycling, uh, in order to get like a real uh, I would say viable process which can uh, be implemented. Uh, um, and this opens new ray. I mean, we, ho we have all like as a lignin community to agree that uh, utilization of technical lignin is, it will be the key, uh, especially in this forest-based industries and uh, emerging biorefinery concepts to enable this uh, transition to the low carbon economy. So yeah, that was about it. Uh, and with that, basically, we're open to questions, I guess.